part two. As the match drew nearer, however, Harry became more and more nervous. Whatever, he told Ron and Hermione. The rest of the team weren't too calm either. The idea of overtaking Slytherin in the House Championship was wonderful. No one had done it for nearly seven years. But would they be allowed to with such a biased referee? Harry didn't know whether he was imagining it or not, but he seemed to keep running into Snape wherever he went. At times he even wondered whether Snape was following him, trying to catch him on his own. Potions lessons were turning into a sort of weekly torture. Snape was so horrible to Harry. Could Snape possibly know they'd found out about the Philosopher's Stone? Harry didn't see how he could, yet he sometimes had the horrible feeling that Snape could read minds. Harry knew when they wished him good luck into outside the changing rooms next afternoon that Ron and Hermione were wondering whether they'd ever see him alive again. This wasn't what you'd call comforting. Harry hardly heard a word of Wood's pep talk as he pulled on his Quidditch robes and picked up his Nimbus 2000. <clears throat> Ron and Hermione, however, meanwhile, had found a place in the stands next to Neville, who couldn't understand why they looked so grim and worried, or why they had both brought their wands to the match. Little did Harry know that Ron and Hermione had been secretly practising the Leg Locker Curse. They'd got the idea from Malfoy using it on Neville and were ready to use it on Snape if he showed any sign of wanting to hurt Harry. Now, don't forget, it's Locomotor Mortis, Hermione muttered, as Ron slipped his wand up his sleeve. I know, Ron snapped, don't nag. Back in the changing room, Wood had taken Harry aside. No, I don't want to pressure you, Potter, but if we ever need an early capture of the snitch, it's now. Finish the game before Snape can favour Hufflepuff, Hufflepuff, Hufflepuff too much. The whole school's out there, said Fred Weasley, peering out of the door. Even, blimey, Dumbledore's come to watch. Harry's heart did a somersault. Dumbledore, he said, dashing to the door to make sure. Fred was right. There was no mistaking that silver beard. Harry could have laughed out loud with relief. He was safe. There was simply no way that Snape would dare to try and hurt him if Dumbledore was watching. Perhaps that was why Snape was looking so angry as the teams marched onto the pitch. Something that Ron noticed too. I've never seen Snape look so mean, he told Hermione. Look, they're off. Oh, someone had poked Ron in the back of the head. It was Malfoy. Oh, sorry, Weasley. Didn't see you there. Malfoy grinned broadly at Crabbe and Goyle. Wonder how long Potter's going to stay on his broom this time. Anyone want a bet? What about you, Weasley? Ron didn't answer. Snape had just awarded Hufflepuff a penalty because George Weasley had hit a bludger at him. Hermione, who had all her fingers crossed in her lap, was squinting fixedly at Harry, who was circling the game like a hawk, looking for the snitch. You know, I think they, they choose people for the Gryffindor... Sorry, let me read that line again. You know how I think they choose people for the Gryffindor team? said Malfoy loudly a few minutes later, as Snape awarded Hufflepuff another penalty for no reason at all. It's people they feel sorry for. See, there's Potter, who's got no parents. Then there's the Weasleys, who've got no money. You should be on the team, Longbottom. You've got no brains. Never went bright red, but turned in his seat to face Malfoy. I'm worth... T -t -t Twelve of you, M Malfoy, he stammered. Malfoy, Crabbe and Go Goyle howled with laughter, but Ron, still not daring to take his eyes from the game, said, You tell him, Neville. Longbottom, if brains were gold, you'd be poorer than Weasley, and that's saying something. Sorry. 
Ron's nerves were already stretched to breaking point with anxiety about Harry. I'm warning you, Malfoy, one more word. Ron, Hermione said suddenly. Harry, what, where? Harry had suddenly gone into a spectacular dive, which drew gasps and cheers from the crowd. Hermione stood up, her crossed fingers in her mouth, as Harry streaked towards the ground like a bullet. You're in luck, Weasley. Potter's obviously spotted some money on the ground, said Malfoy. Ron snapped. Before Malfoy knew what was happening, Ron was on top of him, wrestling him to the ground. Neville hesitated, then clambered over the back of his seat to help. Come on, Harry, Hermione screamed, leaping onto her seat to watch as Harry sped straight at Snape. She didn't even notice Malfoy and Ron rolling around under her seat, or the scuffles and yelps coming from the whirl of fists that was Neville, Crab and Goyle. Up in the air, Snape turned on his broomstick just in time to see something scarlet shoot past him, missing him by inches. Next second, Harry had pulled out of the dive, his arm raised in triumph, the snitch clasped in his hand. The stands erupted. It had to be a record. No one could ever remember the snitch being caught so quickly. Run! Run, where are you? The game's over. Harry's won. We've won. Gryffindor in the lead, shrieked Hermione, dancing up and down on her seat and hugging Pavati Patil in the row in front. Harry jumped off his broom a foot from the ground. He couldn't believe it. He'd done it. The game was over. It had barely lasted five minutes. As Gryffindors came spilling onto the pitch, he saw Snape land nearby, white-faced and tight-lipped. Then Harry felt a hand on his shoulder and looked up into Dumbledore's smiling face. Well done, said Dumbledore quietly, so that only Harry could hear. Nice to see you haven't been brooding about that mirror. You've been keeping busy. Excellent. Snape spat bitterly on the ground. Harry left the changing room alone some time later to take his Nimbus 2000 back to the broom shed. He couldn't ever remember feeling happier. He'd really done something to be proud of now. No one could say he was just a famous name anymore. The evening air had never smelled so sweet. He walked over the damp grass, reliving the last hour in his head, which was a happy blur. Gryffindors running to lift him onto their shoulders, Ron and Hermione in the distance jumping up and down, Ron cheering through a heavy nosebleed. Harry had reached the shed. He leant against the wooden door and looked up at Hogwarts with its windows glowing red in the setting sun. Gryffindor in the lead. He'd done it. He'd shown Snape. And speaking of Snape, a hooded figure came swiftly down the front steps of the castle. Clearly not wanting to be seen, it walked as fast as possible towards the Forbidden Forest. Harry's victory faded from his mind as he watched. He recognised the figure's prowling walk. Snape, sneaking into the forest while everyone else was at dinner. What was going on? Harry jumped back on his Nimbus 2000 and took off. Gliding silently over the castle, he saw Snape enter the forest at a run. Harry followed. The trees were so thick he couldn't see where Snape had gone. He flew in circles lower and lower, brushing the top branches of trees until he heard voices. He glided towards them and landed noiselessly in a towering beech tree. He climbed carefully along one of the branches holding tight to his broomstick, trying to see through the leaves. Below, in a shadowy clearing, stood, stood Snape. But he wasn't alone. Quirrell was there too. Harry couldn't make out the look on his face, but he was stuttering worse than ever. Harry strained to catch what they were saying. I don't, don't, don't know why you wanted to meet here of all places, Severus. Well, I thought we'd keep this private, said Snape, his voice icy. Student aren't, students aren't supposed to know about the Philosopher's Stone after all. Harry leant forward. Quirrell was mumbling something. Snape interrupted him. 
Have you found out how to get past that beast of Hagrid's yet? But, but, but Severus, I... You don't want me as your enemy, Quirrell, said Snape, taking a step towards him. I, I, I don't know what, what you... You know perfectly well what I mean. An owl hooted loudly and Harry nearly fell out of the tree. He steadied himself in time to hear Snape say, Your little bit of hocus pocus. I'm waiting. But I, 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 I don't. Very well, Snape cut in. We'll have another little chat soon when you've had time to think things over and decided where your loyalties lie. He threw his cloak over his head and strode out of the clearing. It was almost dark now, but Harry could see Quirrell standing quite still as though he was petrified. Harry, where have you been? Hermione squeaked. We won! We won! You won! We won! shouted Ron, thumping Harry on the back. And I gave Malfoy a black eye. And Neville tried to take on Crabbe and Goyle single-handed. He's still out cold, but Madame Pomfrey says he'll be all right. Talk about showing Slytherin. Everyone's waiting for you in the common room. We're having a party. Fred and George stole some cakes and stuff from the kitchens. Never mind that now, said Harry Blethers breathlessly. Let's find an empty room. You wait till you hear this. He made sure Peeves wasn't inside before shutting the door behind them. Then he told them what he'd seen and heard. So we were right. It is the Philosopher's Stone, and Snape's trying to force Quirrell to help him get it. He asked if he knew how to get past Fluffy, and he said something about Quirrell's hocus pocus. I reckon there are other things guarding the stone apart from Fluffy. Loads of enchantments, probably, and Quirrell would have done some anti-dark art spell, which Snape needs to break through. So you mean the stone's only safe as long as Quirrell stands up to Snape? said Hermione in alarm. Well, in that case, it will be gone by next Tuesday, said Ron. OK, I'm going to stop there. Uh, tomorrow, we're going to be on chapter 14. Uh, Norbert, the Norwegian Ridgeback. OK, goodbye, everybody. See you tomorrow.